Behind every successful endeavor in life is a relationship built on trust. Welcome to The Trust Doctor, restoring trust and enriching significant relationships, a podcast focused on helping you nurture healthy relationships. Join thought leader and world-renowned expert on relationship and empowerment coaching, Dr. Patty Ann, and her special guests every week for insightful and meaningful conversations filled with great takeaways that will help you build healthier business partnerships and happier romantic relationships. Are you ready to restore trust and enrich the significant relationships in your life? The Trust Doctor, Dr. Patty Ann, is in. Welcome to today's podcast episode of The Trust Doctor, Restoring Trust and Enriching Significant Relationships. And when I tell you I have an exciting, amazing A-list woman as our guest today, I am not kidding. We could still be talking offline now if we didn't realize time was ticking away. (laughs) That is how fabulous this woman is. But before we go any further, since I know you are going to love this interview and love this podcast, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe to The Trust Doctor. So let me get back to our guest. This woman is a financial advisor guru. She has blazed a path where no financial advisor has gone before. And rather than me telling you about her, I would like you to buckle up because Dawn Dalby is about to take us for a ride. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you, Dr. Patty Ann. It's so such a pleasure to be here with you and your energy, and I cannot wait to see where our conversation goes. All right. Well, it's going to go wherever you want it to go. So let's talk. So you talk about money and women and money and emotions and money. And tell us a little bit about your background, how you got to where you are today, because I don't think anybody comes out of the womb thinking, I want to be a behavioral (laughs) financial advisor. And honestly, I had to look that up because I wasn't sure what that was. So tell us how you got here. You know, that's so funny. I'll tell you, I got here because I just wanted to learn about money. I used to be a singer dancer on a cruise ship. And no way, I, no way. How I did, did I not yes. know that about you? Like I worked on cruise ships when I was 20 and I'm now 51. So it's 30 plus years ago, but I, Dawn, I started Dawn, as, They would have thrown me off the cruise ship. I cannot <laughs> sing or dance for the life of me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did get thrown off one cruise ship, but that's for a whole nother podcast. But Drinking I was a singer lady? dancer no. and I... You know, I didn't know I was in hospitality. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do, but I had a friend that was an advisor and I was like, wait a second, you're advising people making triple the amount of money I'm making. You're working four days a week and sign me up. So I, at age 30, at age 30, I decided to change careers and I knew nothing about financial advising. I was broke. They decided to give me a draw of $18,000, which we know you can make more at McDonald's. Um, I who's was they? a mom. Who's they? Who's they? Anybody. Like you could make, oh, who's they? No, no. Um, um, Ameriprise. Okay. Ameriprise Financial Advisors. So they gave me, you know, so I was making nothing. I was a mom of two little baby girls, 18 born, born 18 months apart. All I knew is that I wanted more money and more life. So in order to figure out about money, I decided to learn about money. And so that's how I got into building comprehensive financial plans and all the technical advice. So, Dawn, so let I, me, let me interrupt you for a second, because right. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you said that, right? Because my second book that was a bestseller was money can buy you happiness. Secrets Mm -hmm. women need to know to get paid what they're worth. And people love to say it's, you know, money doesn't make you happy. I'm like, well, try living without it. Mm -hmm. And I think Zig Ziglar said, you know, uh, money doesn't something about money. It's in everything, but it's like air. And it's like oxygen. We need it to survive. Right. But I'm so happy that you said you wanted to learn about money, because for some reason, when women say, yes, I'm working for money, it's almost as if it's a dirty word. Yet, I've never once on the planet heard anybody criticize a guy for saying, yeah, 
I'm, uh, I'm working for the money. And when you talk to men, I've never met a man who thinks he's overpaid. And yet we know plenty of them. And yet so <laughs> many women yeah. will not get paid what they're worth. Anyway, that was my little diatribe. Well, and I'll also tell you this to, to stem off of what you just said is that, I, you know, money alone can not, it, it can make you fulfilled somewhat. And mm-hmm. it can bring happiness in your life. It solves a lot of problems. It gives you choices. So it gives, it you, gives, it you, gives choices you choices and it solves problems. However, you know, I started learning about money and I'll tell you, it, it was, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago that I was still having this broken relationship with money. I was making over a half a million dollars a year. And I was like, why do I feel broke? Like, what is going on with me? I know the technicalities on how to build money, but there's still something else wrong with me. And I saw the same thing with my clients. Like they built their, their, they built their investment portfolios into the millions, but they were still having this emotion, this negative emotional connection with money of they're not going to have enough. And the, the general anxiety disorder of, you know, worrying scarcity. about their had, the mindset the scarcity scarcity. mindset. And I was just like, okay, like what is wrong? So I started peeling back this personal development, this emotional competency that you're so great at the relationship, the communication. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I just have to re I I have to have a different mindset and how I think about wealth. And I have to have a different emotional reaction of how I'm building my wealth. And so I created this platform after years and years of years of studying personal development and setting financial growth and, you know, being a fiduciary and a CFP. And I have found now that when you say money does buy happiness, but I believe when you build your worth and your wealth combined and live life at this this intersection that I call building your internal security, being secure with who you are as a human being and having the financial security at the same time, like that is happiness, that's fulfillment, that's contentment, that's peace, that's all the things that we're all striving for. Okay, so in a moment, I think I'd like you to talk about the live wealthy because I think that's where you're going with this. But what you just addressed is so interesting because, you know, what I always tell people is that all decisions are based on emotion, even financial decisions. And that helps explain why someone that grew up poor, no matter how much money they create, many of those people have that, you know, lack of lack of money mindset. Right. And then you think about in the United States, April 15th, the date hasn't changed since I think it was established. We all have to pay our taxes. And yet in February, the accountant says, okay, this is what you owe. And you're like, oh, well, I don't have any money for that. Well, (laughs) that's an emotional decision that you made because logically, you know, your taxes are due on April 15th, but you don't save for it. It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you're dumb. It's because emotionally, there's a connection there where you're not saving for the money. And I think, um, you know, money is so wrought with emotion. And, you know, I created money personalities and so much of how we view money has to do with how, what we learned about money growing up. The messages we receive from society, right? Money is the root of all evil. Money doesn't grow on trees. And the message, what we heard our parents say, or more likely thought about money. And again, it has nothing to do with how much money you have, but it has to do with your mindset towards the money. So, so speak about that as someone that really embraces that psychological, along with the financial aspect of money. Well, and just to add what you just said, Bruce Lipton in his book, Biology of Beliefs, says that our belief about ourself and our wealth are formed by the time we're age six. Yeah. So yeah. think about that. We don't even know how to tie our shoes at age six, but we all, we already have a belief system about how money works. And it's the subliminal messages. It's the nonverbal messages we receive from our parents and our grandparents. I always say, you remember, I remember growing up and, you know, my grand, my grandmother would take all the Christmas bows that just flew off all the presents because she wanted to save them for the next <laughs> year again. Right. Um, and so, so it, we have that mindset in our mind. And so, you know, personally going through that myself, cause I was like, gosh, I make more money. I make five times as much money as I thought I ever would. Why do I still have this feeling? And my clients, Whoa, what's the I, feel? wait, wait, what the, the, was feeling the feeling was being broke that there was never enough. Like I, I, I 10 years ago, I used to get the credit card bill in the mail, right? It wasn't online. I was like, oh, 
like here it comes like what did i spend right it's just emotion and spending it's like oh do i have enough to support that or not and it would freak me out and um you know i'm the only i am the primary income earner in our household and have been so i've had you know to be a mom raise a you know there's four of us in our family and um are I you like married nice stuff. do you have yes a, are you married? i've been married okay. to my high school sweetheart for 26 years, I've been with him oh. for 35 years. Congratulations. Good yes. for you. So you were together when you were dancing and singing your way through we were, life? We were, we were on the cruise ships together. We were in show choir together in high school. Yeah, we, uh, you know, not easy. And you're from, um, you're from Minnesota. So is that Minnesota nice? It's, uh, you know, I don't know. Is Minnesota nice? Maybe. I don't know if all Minnesotans <laughs> are nice, but there's a lot of them down here. I'm in Arizona right now. Um, I'm trying to break the Minnesota accent. So, um, you know, my daughters who I moved down with me, obviously to, to Arizona three and a half years ago, they're like, mom, you sound like a Midwestern. You need to work on your, you know, mm -hmm. your delivery and your dialect. I'm like, whatever. So anyway, leave it to your kids, um, leave it to your kids. Yeah, you have the best day on the planet. You're like, mom. Nah. Right. right. We're talking it, about yes. that. Crazy. Um, but I just, I just realized that, that at, through my clients, through myself and through other colleagues in, you know, I'm in a male dominated industry yeah. and being around other male colleagues in my life and realize how they treated me about like what I was worth financially and how they, um, gave me these, you know, like subconsciously message, subconscious messages of I wasn't worth enough, or I didn't deserve this type of income and how they also, I mean, I'm talking about people that make seven figures a year plus that were still toxic people, people that you didn't really feel like you were enough to be around them. And then you start peeling back. Why do these people, they have money. Like, why do these people still act like this and still, you know, um, you can never measure up to them. And then you start having dialogue and conversations and it's like, oh, you haven't dealt with your pain. You haven't emotionally dealt with your life's challenges. And when you were younger and all the things that happened to us, and when you don't go through personal development and deal with your pain and your struggle and, and, and do it in the right way, you're either numbing yourself through alcohol or you're, you're trying to, you know, become greedy and rich with money because you think that's going to numb the pain. But once I started realizing like, no money, money doesn't matter if you're not dealing with your internal worth and how you think and feel about yourself. So building your self-esteem is great, but if you do that without money, it freaking sucks. And if you just build money and don't have the self-esteem, it doesn't suck as much, but it's still not the best place to be. Well, it, but it I, sucks in a big, it sucks in a big house and a nice car. It does suck, but it's not <laughs> as bad as being poor and thinking bad about yourself, right? That right, is like, right. that's not in a good position as well, but it's just like, gosh, you know, the, the, and again, we, we are always trying to, we're always trying to achieve and to grow into something more like life is this onion and it keeps peeling back. And the more we know, and the more we become aware of ourselves, it keeps getting be more beautiful as we go. But, you know, we're always striving for something new. And I believe that personal development is a hundred percent about growth. And it's about learning about your awareness of who you are, how to communicate with others, how to deal with the storms of life like how do you deal with the daily challenges and it's it's all in our reaction and you know that as a, a emotional expert sure sure mm -hmm. so so tell us how you got so smart i would say i got smart from learning about myself learning and learning and learning what you know i marry my high school sweetheart like uh, 20 years ago, I said, I can't wait for our girls to be 18 and 19. I'm going to divorce you. Like, I can't stand to be around you. Like we're the opposite, right? I'm super outgoing. He's super introvert and he likes to be alone in his movie theater. And I like to have a party and it's been really hard. But then when, you know, we went through therapy and I, and I started analyzing human behavior just because of out of pure curiosity. And I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Everything in my life stems from within. Like the, the problems that I'm having right now in my marriage and with my colleagues and with my pocketbook and with my kids. Oh, that's an inside problem. They're about me. <laughs> oh, okay. So I constantly worked on myself. And the other thing is, is that 
you know, three and a half years ago, actually, is it August? It's almost August. So yes. four years ago, almost to the date, my we moved to Arizona and we decided that it was healthier emotionally to live in a place where we could see the sun. And is that what, prompt, you know, is that what prompted the move? Is that was that really what prompted? Uh, yes. One well, and million why Arizona, percent. not California, other than the what the eight percent <laughs> income tax. <laughs> tax and traffic in California. You know, I always thought you said you're moving to Florida. I hope that's public knowledge because I just said that. Well, it is now. It is now. (laughs) She's moving (laughs) to Naples and her address is one, two, three. No, um, I'm kidding about that. But, um, you know, here's what I always thought I'd move to Florida because I I grew up. And the mail will be forwarded to Dawn. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. That tax bill, send it right to me. Um, no, but we came here and visited and I just love the no humidity. I love the mm-hmm. high skies. I love the sun. I love the, the wellness type of lifestyle where you can live in and outdoors. You don't get that in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And there's like three days a year. That's beautiful in the Midwest, in my opinion, because then there's bugs and mosquitoes and blah. So anyway, although I do have a, although I do have a colleague Dawn from uh, several from Arizona and I love this man. And he texted me the other day. It's 113 degrees in Arizona, dot, dot, yeah. dot. It feels like 113 degrees in Arizona. It is, but but it's not like you're walking outside without your shoes on. Like you go outside, <laughs> you're in the pool. You're just yeah. walking. It, it, it's way better than six months of clouds that hang right here and the depression that the Midwest offered oh, me. I have a lot of I energy. I just can't deal with that. Like, like I felt yeah. trapped. Yeah, the um, weather definitely impacts our mindset. There's no, it does. There's no doubt That's, the hypothalamus, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's real. And, um, so we moved to Arizona, but here's the thing is my mother decided to move with us and to start her life over in Arizona at age 73. And she flew in on August 9th, four years ago, and we went out to dinner. And on August 11th, I woke up to her passing away in my house. And it was, she passed away on the day that we were going to move her to her new condo. She was just starting her life. And I woke up to my husband pounding on the doors. It was it, um, because I was sleeping with my teenage daughter in Arizona, there's monsoons and it was raining and storming and lightning. And we were in a rental home and my 15 year old was scared. So I was like, I'll sleep with you, which mama loves anyway. But I slept with her that night and my husband, I saw him banging on the door at eight o'clock in the morning. He's like, get up, get up. And I was like, what? And he looked at me, he goes, you're a mom. And I'm like, yeah, we're moving mom to her condo today. Like, what do you mean? But the look on his face, I knew it was something else. So I ran into the main house and sure enough, she was slumped over in her bed and Mm -hmm. gone on the day that we were moving her. And so I started going, huh, like what really happened here? Well, I I realized she passed away from a heart attack and she had diabetes. And why did she have diabetes? She had diabetes because she had what's called Whipple surgery. I don't know if you've heard of Whipple surgery, but it's surgery on your pancreas. She had a a non-cancerous tumor on her pancreas 20 years prior to that. Well, why did she have that tumor on her pancreas? Because she was an alcoholic and she drank a lot to numb her pain. And so, you know, it wasn't, you know, so I started feeling like, why did she drink all the time? And I had this love hate relationship with her. I hate even using the word hate because I love my mom, but it was just, just this really dynamic relationship where it's just this, Oh, I love you. And then you drive me crazy. And it was because of her drinking and she drank to numb her pain. But when I did her eulogy and I started like thinking of like, mom, what message do I want to send to the world on this? It's she drank because she didn't have the self-esteem. She never loved herself enough. She, she grew up with five brothers and they had to split hot dogs um, to be able to afford food. But her dad had enough money to buy lots of people alcohol every happy hour at the bar. Right. But she grew up in this really poor environment and, al- and alcoholic environment as well. And, it like. Oh, like, yes, an alcoholic environment. And so that's she, what she was learned. never, that's what she learned. She, numb the pain she learned. And she wasn't able to get out of that after years and years of trying But that's why my mom died probably 20 years premature is because she didn't love herself enough and she didn't have that self-worth. And then I realized, Ooh, (laughs) 
I'm modeling my mom's behavior now, or I have been. And how do I start working on that? And well, oh, I think it's doing it. Or, no, or no, not the drinking. I've never. Well, you went the no. opposite. You went the no, exact but I meant, opposite. I, I modeled her. Be, well, I'm a workaholic. I'm not an right. alcoholic, but I'm well, a either you're still You're impacted by it. either you mimic the behavior or you stay as far away from it as you can get. Yeah. Or a combination. Like I, I, yeah. yeah. Like I can still have alcohol. I can have a drink or two, but it's, I'm never addicted to that, but I am addicted to like growth and success and wanting more and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I realized though, that I was always fighting because I wasn't enough as well. And mm -hmm. so that's really the defining moment. Um, you know, little steps throughout my career. Okay. I built money. Great. Oh, now I got to build my worth because the money is not alone. It's not going to solve my life desire, which is to live a purposeful life. And, and then realizing I was modeling my mom's behavior and realizing all this kind of stuff. Like I've seen in my clients, my colleagues, myself, my husband, my, like I'm seeing it all over the place. And I'm like, oh my gosh, wouldn't this be really cool? If I could create a program, a digital program where I could start giving this type of wealth and worth advice out to the masses and not just focus on people coming into my investment firm that already have a million dollars that want to build their financial plan because they have the same emotional issues, but they just want, but they, but they already have the money. But what about those people that are in their twenties and thirties and forties that don't have the money? And they're still having an emotional relationship with money and they still need to have someone to teach them how to live life at this next level. And so I built this pr pr um, platform a couple of years ago and it's um, called Own It, Earn It, Grow It, where you get to own your worth, earn your wealth, which is negotiation and earning, you know, being okay with earning more money and knowing how to do it. I think we're all okay, but knowing how to do it is another thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, going through the financial planning so you can live life at this elevated level. And um, and I'm opening up the doors, like I've opened up the doors to help the people, no matter where they're at in their walk, in their wealth building journey, that they can come to us and get this fiduciary, non-biased advice and help them grow and invest their money and help them with their tax planning and help them with their relationship with money and how to grow their income and how to like a, be super crystal clear on what you want out of life. Like all that together, there's not another platform out there. And I'm, you can clearly see I'm super passionate about it because it's going to transform and it already has, but it's going to transform multiple thousands of people's lives. And I cannot wait to, well, I can wait, but 20 years from now, just go, wow, it's not what I did, right? It's through the learning of what we all did together. And I cannot wait for that day. Well, I, I mean, you are so excited about it. I'm excited about it. So share with us, share with the listeners, give us three common obstacles that get in the way of people owning, earning, and growing their wealth. I would say the first obstacle is their belief system. Like we talked about earlier, it's sometimes women say, I don't believe I should earn a certain income. I had now, someone excuse say me, me Dawn. Oh, your, your clients aren't just women though, right? They're, they're, they're not women? just women. Yeah. No, okay. no. Ab but I had a okay. woman come to me recently and say, well, I don't deserve, oh, I don't deserve to have an income double of what I'm making because I don't have a college degree. And I'm like, really? You know, just because of a college degree, like we got to get that old school thinking out of our minds. So it's your belief system is so vitally important. That's the step, step number one, because your beliefs filter your experience and you're not even aware of it. So it's limited. It, so it's limited beliefs. It's limiting beliefs. Yes. And what you think is possible in your life. And so that's the first thing that I think is the most important thing is reevaluating what your beliefs are and changing them up. Number two, which you're an expert in, it's this emotional intelligence. It's, you know, they've interviewed the most wealthiest people in our country, and it's not because they're smarter than you and I, it's because they think differently and they behave differently. It's their, I, it's their EQ, not their IQ. And I think that's so important for women and men and, and anybody to really understand your emotions and how that's driving your decisions in life. Mm -hmm. And how we get caught up in this noise 
of life and not being able to see a bigger perspective of what's going on. And again, because we're typically insecure human beings, but working through that fear, that biggest emotion for me is dealing with your fear and, and, and pushing through the fear to be able to get on the other side. Like I still have, and I hate to admit this because I'm, I'm trying to not tell my brain this. So I'm going to use the word used to, but it might mean in a present tense. I used mm -hmm. to have a fear of flying. I used to be afraid of getting on an airplane and feeling trapped and being afraid that I wasn't going to be able to get out of this tube. That used to happen to me, but it's when I deal and I get on that airplane and push through that fear and get to that destination, there's something beautiful on the other side. So that to me is number two, is pushing through that emotional fear. And then third, I would say it's really like so many people are afraid and they don't have a financial plan. We're talking about recessions today. We're talking about investing. We're talking about interest rate heights. We're talking about, you know, all of the negative stuff. And so many people feel like I don't have enough or I'm not smart enough or I, I shouldn't have a financial plan. Well, I'm telling you something. If you deal with fear and you deal with anxiety, that's a lack of, that's a loss of control. And if you want control back in your life, you know how you create uncertainty in your life is have a financial plan. It's really easy to set up and it's even easier to keep it ongoing. But, but we work, we work so hard for our money. We have to have our money investing and work equally hard for us. We have to, we have to do the tax work. Like we literally have to learn how to minimize our taxes so we can actually live free today and enjoy the spending freedom, not guilt free, not guilt spending, but guilt free spending and enjoy this today as well as safer tomorrow. You need the balance of both. And so it's how you think it's you're getting through your fear and it's creating a financial plan that's going to help you get to this next level. I mean, that, that is so great. And so much of it, like you said, so much of my work is with you know, it's always about taking personal responsibility, right? We love to say it's everybody else's fault, everybody. But if we take personal responsibility, first of all, it's true. We control the narrative, right? We can change the narrative or we allow ourselves to be sucked into it, right? And then the limited beliefs. And, and also what's amazing from the neuroscience perspective is that our brain believes what it, we tell it. Our brain doesn't know that, that if we say we're stupid or we're not worth something, what, that that's not true. They will believe that as truth. So what I tell people all the time is we talk to ourselves in a way we would never let anybody else talk to us. But it's Absolutely. very dangerous because our brain takes it as truth. But here's the wonderful thing about owning your everything that go, goes on in your life, taking the personal responsibility, owning the fear. When you're the one that owns it, you then have the power to change it. Mm -hmm. Because if every if it's everybody else's fault, you can't do anything else about, you can't do anything about what anybody else thinks or feels. All you can do is manage, not control, but manage how you feel and how you behave. And that will in fact influence how other people behave back to you. It might look like they've changed, but really all they've done is responded differently to, okay, I hit something, I see your reaction. Go where you wanna go with that. Right. Well, I, I always say you get what you tolerate in life. So if mm -hmm. someone, you know, how someone else is acting towards you, it's a reflection of what you think about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's so vitally important that we have to understand that everything stems from within. And here's, here's one thing that you just said, which I think is really interesting is that you talk, you talk to your community about responsibility and taking ownership of that fear and, and how you're maneuvering everything. through life, everything. everything. And I always encourage my team and my community is that the responsibility and how to measure that is really looking at how you're spending your time throughout the day. I've had people come to me and say, I want more money. Like I deserve to get paid more or, you know, my employer at work is, you know, being a bully or whatever the, whatever the issue is. And I always say, you know, so for example, the first issue of getting, wanting to get paid more, well, how are you spending your time at work? Like literally for a week, go down and, and analyze 
how you're spending each hour. You know, are you scrolling? Are you checking your emails 50 times a day? Are you going on social media? Are you having conversations, uh, you know, that have nothing to do with results? And that responsibility that you're talking to, if you want higher income, and yes, we all deserve more income, you also have to look yourself in the mirror and say, how am I spending my time to get better results? And how am I measured? against that versus uh, against the responsibility I'm taking on as a human being. Because I think so many times we operate below our pay grade and we don't even realize it. Like mm -hmm. we're not doing the things that drive more revenue and mm -hmm. you're not doing those hard things because of fear or we, it makes us uncomfortable. We have to get outside of the box. You know, like if you don't do those things, you're not going to get to that next level. And I think that's so important. And for people to understand that are listening, I have more fear than like I, my mom grew up in an anxious home. Like I have, I have generalized anxiety disorder. I have fear. I have, I'm no different. Dr. Patty Ann is no, by the way, my mom's name's Patricia Ann. Oh, oh my gosh. You're kidding me. No, but, but you're oh, no wow. different either. It's just, yeah, the, it was, right. It's about this community of people to support, just like we were talking about prior. It's about supporting each other because I might have more energy than you, or I might have more financial knowledge than you, but I, everyone I, I would has challenge you on that. I would challenge you on that, but I don't think there's many like us. <laughs> yeah, but, yes. Um, but I was saying you as a listener too. Yes. Like there's use, there's use. um use, like all of you. Like I know I have a lot of energy, but but you but the use, other people bring some other value to my life. Right. And when you're open to receiving that, when we work in a community, that's where we're all able to get to that, you know, breakthrough, that next level, whatever that living wealthy level looks like for you. Well, it's so true. I mean, look, I, I work because I'm not cheap. <laughs> I work with really wealthy people and their issues are not all that different than everybody else's. But the complication for them is that they are surrounded by single fans and people that will tell them what they want to hear. Let's take Michael Jackson, for example, right? He died young because everybody that surrounded him wanted a piece of him. Everybody wanted a piece of the gravy train. Nobody really cared about him. And he was clouded by that. The money just created so much noise. But when you take the personal responsibility and you say, okay, I want to be paid more or I want more in my life, right? You're looking at it from time. The words I use is, okay, what's the value add you're bringing to the situation, right? And then are you raising your hand? Are you spending your energy? Because it takes a hell of a lot of energy to avoid our fear, to not go there, right? So, you know, I think it's Winston Churchill that said, when you're going through hell, keep on going. And then you come out the other end. So if you face the fear and if you raise your hand to do the project, do whatever that nobody else wants, Take the initiative, even if you don't know at that moment what the hell you're doing. You just need to be one or two steps ahead of everybody else. Because guess what? I can't believe it with all the consulting I do, how much people are full of crap. They act like they know what they're doing and they have no clue. So all you need to do is to be willing to learn and to stay one or two steps ahead, but to be genuine, to be authentic. And if you do that, your worth will increase. And if it's not given to you, now you can say, I took on this initiative. This was my ROI. This is what I'm doing. And for entrepreneurs like you and I, my value add is this, this will, I can, you can alleviate this by working with me. And what's it costing you emotionally? to not be able to get this pain relieved or whatever it is that you want relieved. Because I work with a lot of entrepreneurial couples and it's like what you said, you could be working forever, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you. something brilliant that you just said that just resonated with me and, and I've never put too much thought into it, but it is so true. Like it takes more energy to avoid the issue and the fear that takes way more energy than it is to just deal with a fear mm -hmm. that plus you made a comment of 
you know, most people are walking, running around this earth thinking that their britches are bigger than them, right? Britches, that's mm-hmm. like an old person saying, no, old I'm school. showing my age. It's Midwestern, go saying. ahead. <laughs> um, like, like they are, be- you know, like. Yeah, in New York, it, we would say their shit doesn't stink. <laughs> their shit doesn't stink, but it really does stink. But if you start peeling back the why behind the why behind the why they're acting like that, I can guarantee you that it has to do with a self-esteem issue. Absolutely. Because they're not growing in their thinking. They're not growing in their emotions and their fear. And when you don't grow, you have a lower self-esteem and then you have to put up this big act like your shit doesn't stink or that you're better than everybody else or nobody can live up to you. And it's because you haven't dealt with that. And when we deal with our, our grossness of life, we all have it. But when we deal with that, like that just makes you, and, and you, it makes people like you better. It makes, makes people want to listen to you. It's yeah. human. And then people are like, oh my gosh, now how can I do that? My biggest thing in life is to, to live and give and living is learning about yourself and learning all about the stuff that we were born with that we need to fix. And then how do we portray that and give it to others? Just like karma, just like, you know, p- paying it forward. When we all understand that, and come accustomed to that and get outside of our selfish thinking that it's all about me, but it's actually all about the reason why people think it's all about them is because they're not doing the work inside. So they're, they're needy, right? But when you, when you do the work, then it's not about you anymore. It's about serving. And when people one by one by one of us understands that, think about what a different place this entire planet could be. Yeah. For maybe not in our generation time, hopefully it can start, but like, you know, our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, like think about the opportunity if we just think better and act differently. Sure. It, it, it is so true. And everybody has stuff they have to deal with. And when people come across so well put together, I'm like, boy, they, they're really buttoned up. What are they holding inside? But it makes mm-hmm. you more relatable, mm-hmm. right? It, it, when, when, it's why in the military, when you go through boot camp, those friendships last for life. Or if you're you're in war, you because you've been in it together and you've come out the other end. That's really life. We've that all, life. everybody's parents, unless they're crazy and there are real crazy people in the world, everybody's parents tried to do the best they can. Mm-hmm. And everybody's parents fell short, including us, mm-hmm. right? But that doesn't mean you didn't do the best you can. But feel very strongly about this, and this is harsh. The moment we stop growing, the moment we stop trying to learn, we start dying. That's the mistake people make when they think they retire. Like, what are you, what are you retiring from? What's Okay, so make a contribution, right? What is your contribution going to be? Well, I'm gonna just sit back and collect social security and you know, do it then you're not giving anymore. Mm-hmm. Not everybody, but so, and, and then you slowly, but surely you, I say you lose your edge. Like how much golf can you play? Lord, how much TV can people watch? There's enough. We have so many channels and there is nothing to watch. It blows my mind. <laughs> and I'm like, I, you know, honestly, I've done a lot of TV and like a lot of daytime stuff. And I'm like, Who's watching this crowd? I know. <laughs> it's new. What are you doing home? That's terrible. That sounded terrible. All right. I'm going to get all but the it's criticism. Real. It's real. No, but it is real. I mean, you think about what you see on TV, it's either dramatized or it's negative news because they want you to pay attention. They're trying to, you know, create, create you to click. It's clickbait for, for everybody. So, right. I'm, well, and I'm also, and also, I mean, you know, we all know, know it's the negative headlines that sells, but for people that are struggling with anxiety and so many people have an ADD, ADHD, they will tell you, shut the TV off. I mean, I have, I've, I stopped watching the, the news a while ago. I'll get my news on my, my phone. But even then, I used to say this years ago before all this fancy stuff, I used to tell my kids, when you read something, you have to know who the author is because you need to know where they're coming from. That is so true today. If you put on CNN, you know what you're getting. If you put on Fox, you know what you're getting. I sort of kind of just want to give me the facts. I can think for myself. I have that ability to critically think like 13 years of college taught me something. But now nobody, everybody wants 
people want to be told what to think and do, which really blows my mind. So what do you do when your clients come to you? Because I, w- I would imagine they, they don't create, create my plan for me. It, that's probably the last thing you want to do. So ha- how do you manage that? Manage when people tell you to create the financial plan for them that they need? Well, I ask the hard questions too. Um, I've had multiple clients say to me, you really make me think because (laughs) we're not just, remember creating a financial plan is not just an investment portfolio, but it's a spending plan. It's, you know, your cash reserves, your, all your lines of protection planning your investment planning, your goal planning, your taxes, your estate plan, it's everything. And so I really dive deep into the questions of, you know, let's take a look at not just what you're trying to achieve from a financial perspective in the future, but what are you really trying to achieve today too? Because I want you through a financial planning process, I want you to be able to live for today and plan for tomorrow at the same time. So I really ask them about, you know, when I dive deep, it's about what are your core values? What are the things you don't want to live life without? And how do we create a plan around your core values? How do we create a spending and savings plan around those things? So we know that you will always have and be enough. And so we go really deep into the behavioral side, which is the psychology of money. And, and when, when, you know, and how, uh, I asked you, how do they want to spend their time? You know, money aside, like, how do you just want to live? So, you know, so I asked them layers and layers of questions before we even put together a financial plan and even go, okay, here's the type of asset allocation and diversification you should have. And here's the standard deviation and here's how it should perform in times like these, like the market volatility. And when do we take advantage of, you know, the tax bill, like all the technical stuff. Most, most people do this when I start talking technical, you know, or they wouldn't hire, right. Or they wouldn't hire me to do that. Um, But but it's really making sure that they have a solid foundation of life mm-hmm. and how they choose to live. And then as a fiduciary, which means I, you know, I'm, I, by, by law have to sit on the same side of the table of the clients, meaning by law, I have to put their best interests way ahead of mine. So I'm not mm-hmm. there selling them a product or trying to make a commission. I'm there solely to, to give them objective financial advice. And so when you get to that level of comfort where they're like, oh, she's just real and going to tell me how it is, then we start, you know, I do the detail part of the plan. So when it hits the, the reality fan of like, oh my gosh, the market's down 23%. Oh my gosh, inflation's at, you know, 40 year high. Oh my gosh, interest rates are high. Like, how do I deal with all of that? Like I help them build a plan that's going to weather all types of storms. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the important thing, but, but a real true advisory relationship, it's not just about the numbers Mm because I did just the numbers for 15 years and it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough. We want the money, but you got to have a deeper relationship with your money because your relationship, you're a relationship expert, your relationship with money with yourself, with your spouse, with your kids, it resembles a, a similarities. It's a common like, denominator, right? Co- and it's and, all the core values. You, you and said it's it. all the, yeah, it's all the core values. And I think that's so vitally important because at the end of the day, I'm super passionate about life. Like I want to get the most out of life that I possibly can. I want to learn. I want to lead. I want to educate. I want to support. I want to give people the opportunity to, to know what's possible for them when they think a little bit differently and go through their fear. Like that's my why. And creating that why gives me the energy to live super passionate and everybody deserves to live life at, at that maximum potential for themselves because nobody else is different. We just, the way we go about it is differently. And I just want everyone to be as happy as possible as we can on this earth. I don't think we fully get to that hundred percent ultimate, like, oh my gosh, I arrived. I think that might happen after we cross over the little bridge, but you know, we're trying to strive for that. I just want to feel better and I want to understand better. And I want more wisdom in my life. Well, I think, I think, you know, happiness is a choice and it's not when I get this, I'll be happy. It's you choose to be happy on the journey every single day, right? At the end of your life, nobody ever said, you know, I wished I worked more or I wished I'd had a ton of money. Usually their wishes about healthier, happier relationships. So 
what I'm struck by, I'm so curious about this. So for anybody under, I don't know, I'm going to make the number up 40, 35, we haven't had a recession. Well, we haven't, I, I, I'm not the financial person, right? So the market, like a rising tide lifts all boats. So now, I don't know, two weeks ago, like I'll say it, I didn't open up my statement. <laughs> I don't want to see it. I have CNBC on my app. I see the red. I don't need to know the details. Um, how do you handle people when they're freaking out like some of them are now? Yeah, like, what, such what, a great what, question. What do you, what do you go to? So here's what we do is I always use this analogy similar to how I used to think about flying. Like when I get nervous about being on that airplane, it's like the thing that calms my nerves is the no different than what calms the nerves of someone in their money, like losing their money. It's like losing their oxygen, right? Their life. And so what we do is just, we give them the statistical data. We give them the analysis. We show them based on the risk and how their portfolio has been designed, proactively designed, that it will act like this in this situation. There's a 98% chance that it's never going to be lower than X. Like the market's down, what, 20-ish, depends on the day. You know, my client's portfolios are down 10. It's not that they're going to, they're not, not losing. They're still losing, but they're, the, the, the losses are minimized. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to mitigate the risk and, and showing them the charts and graphs. Like, guess what? A recession typically lasts, what, 10 to 14 months. And by the way, by the time we know we're in a recession, we're like six months in and we don't even realize it. By the time we know it, we're, all, we're always on the way out. Right. So I just like telling them, here's how statistically or historical um, uh, what has happened his historically. And it's never going to be exactly the same, but it's going to operate. Like you should have an investment portfolio that's built to weather recessions because they happen every 10 years or so. Right. Market volatility happens every three or four years. Like when my clients start to complain, most of them don't. Like there's maybe one about there's their performance. There's always that, you know, 80 there's 20 always, rule, right? Yeah. The 80, 20 um, but when they start to like get, because it's a fearful, right? We show them like, okay, let me tell you what the stock market did in 2016 and 17 and 18 and nine, like 23, 22, 18. But, you know, I'm like, oh, so you're down 10? Like, really? Yeah. Really? Like, and then so you, you start put to it, position. You put it in perspective. You well, put they have to have perspective. And then it's like, yeah. okay, once they have perspective, they're like, oh, I feel so much better. I feel yeah. so much better. And that's just, they just, they need to, that's the technical details that they want. They don't want to know the standard deviation of a, of an investment, but they want to know like when hitting the fan, like, is my, is my money going to go to zero? And is it performing like it should in this market volatility? Yeah, they want to make what? sure they're not going to eat cat food. Correct. And the other thing is they also want to make sure that like, I always go, but hang on, there's always an opportunity in every situation. So right. can we take, can we peel off 10% of your portfolio and put it into the equity market right now that's on sale 20%, you know, based on your lifestyle and how you're spending money from your portfolio, when you're going to retire, like, is there an opportunity here for you? And mm -hmm. nine out of 10 times it's yes, let's do it. There's mm -hmm. always an opportunity in everything. I mean, just like Warren Buffett says, you know, when people are greedy, like last year and the year before. And then half of, you know, the majority of 2020 and the majority of, you know, 18, like people are greedy. That's the time to be fearful. And yeah. when it's time to be greedy is when everyone else is fearful. To be bold. And so, to be bold. And you yeah. look at that right now. It's like, okay, maybe there is, maybe you are right. There is some opportunity out there for me to take advantage of this recession and market volatility because yeah. it's going to happen again. It's just part right. of the life we live. And it's just about having your financial plan, knowing ahead of time, proactively, how to manage your emotions and manage your investments. That's it. So, right. This is a statement. That, so there's two things. So my husband always says, and he is Mr. Steady as he goes, like he could, he could make a million dollars, come in, steady, lose a million dollars, come in steady, like very grounded, not too high, not too low. Um, and what he always says is you've lost nothing. If you haven't sold it, you've gained nothing. If you haven't sold it, it's just on paper. It's all paper. He goes, so don't worry about it. And it'll come back. Just like he's saying, you know what, when the worst thing an investor can do is not decide if she if he or she should be an investment A, B, or C, 
but it's about making the wrong emotional decisions and selling at the wrong time. Again, it's the emotion. Emotion. They say the average investor gets 3.6% over the last, I think it was a 20 year schedule. The average, the the S&P has done about 10%. Why is the average investor getting 3.6? Because they make the wrong emotional decisions Decision. at the wrong time. Right. Yep, that's All right. It. So I am going to open up Pandora's box. I don't even know if this is in your wheelhouse, but I have to ask it because I am desperately trying to understand this. Not that I put a ton of time and energy into it, but a little bit. So what's your take on this whole crypto? Great question. Here's the thing. Crypto's not... Um, regulated yet. So I'm a little hesitant to put a lot of money in. However, I tell clients, you know, it's very speculative. However, if you have enough money, if you have enough money and you built the foundation of your retirement plan and put money in crypto that you can actually afford to lose, maybe it's 5% of your portfolio. But I would suggest is that you diversify your crypto in in actual crypto, not in exchange traded fund cryptos, but actually in the, the I don't want to say the physical crypto, but actual in crypto, because um, we don't know which one's going to win at this point. So if you want to dabble in it, great. But 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 do it with regular crypto. I have, I have one client that actually invested in crypto because I clear through Charles Schwab. It's not on our platform yet. So I can't literally invest in crypto for clients. But I had a client that took some money, invested it in crypto and his cash on the sidelines was locked up because of some X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter why, but now he can't get at his crypto and he can't get at his cash to take money out or in. I mean, it's Mm. not regulated yet, you guys. Do I think people are going to get lucky on this and make a boatload of money? I do. But do not do it unless you have your core portfolio Mm -hmm. built. You can only risk the amount of money you're willing to lose. Yeah. I think Yeah, I think that's great advice. Not that I know anything, but the way I look at it is the fact that the the fact that the government is starting to talk about we have to regulate it. So the government's looking for their piece of the pie. To me, that suggests it might have some legs, right? The government wants a piece of it. All right, maybe it will be around. Quite frankly, I don't care what Jamie Dimon says, you know, Warren Buffett's a genius. Charlie Munger's a genius, but eh, they're sort of kind of on the half, second half, right? Um, but I, I feel like you know, like like I've been studying a little about Ethereum. And again, you know, you take a couple of bucks that you absolutely can't afford to lose. The market's down like crazy. I'm like, ah, maybe I don't even know how to buy it, kind of thing. But I'm just so interested. I love listening to the conversation. And I love when the stand, when the traditional suits, I call them, middle-aged old white men, no, 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 it's not going to happen. I remind people, and again, I, I'm just listening to this because I'm just trying to learn. I remind people, these were the same people that said, what's Amazon? The internet will never work. Um, Apple, what's Apple? Who needs uh-huh. a, you know, who needs a phone kind of thing? So who's going to be on the, the leading edge of cutting edge technology, probably younger people, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm just struck by that. So tell us what you do for fun. I know you said you're a workaholic, but tell us you have to have fun. You have such great energy. I mean, I would love to go out with you. I would love to go out with you too. Here's what I love to do for fun. This is what gets me giddy is I love to go in crate and barrel and I love to buy (laughs) stuff for the house. And I love to prep for a dinner party and like make the food all pretty. I suck. I freaking suck in the kitchen. My husband can cook, but I sometimes buy it, you know, cater it in and put it in my own dishes. Like I like to make presentations. A woman after my own heart. I yeah. Don't I, to it, cook. I have no time, no time. Yeah. No time or no patience. And um, so I love to do that, that get like having parties, having people over entertaining, designing, like, I love decor and designing houses and that whole thing. That is like my ultimate, like I'm having a blast. So I love to do that. And I love to have fun with my daughters. I like to give my daughters advice. They don't listen to me a lot. Are they? Why would they? uh, Why would they? I know. They're 13 year old friends know way much more than you. Yeah. They're 17 and 18 and they just, you know. They definitely know everything. (laughs) They roll their eyes at me and it's, yeah. Um, But I, I think they listen to me 
and they watch me, but I don't think they're going to admit it. Um, but I do love to give them advice, even though they roll their eyes at me. And I love to go out and like, do you want to go to lunch? Do you want to go to target? Do you want to like go get our nails done? Like, I love ha having that, that quality time with them. Mm -hmm. That's not really planned. It's just last minute. Like yesterday, it's like, Hey, it's national ice cream day. Let's make, uh, you know, ice cream Sundays. They're like, <laughs> you know, and eat half of it like that. To me, that's like the fun part about life. Yeah. And just, again, it's connection. I just love human beings and I love to connect with others. Awesome. So, so what I'm looking at now is not a virtual screen, right? That looks like Crate and Bauer right behind you. It's, it is, a, it's not virtual. Yeah, it is Crate. You're right. It, Everything it looks like, like, I noticed it yeah. when we first came on. I'm like, that crate looks and like Crate and Bauer. Crate. Yeah. I just, and the, the signs are you. Target, they're Target. I love Target too online. Um, it's so do you have back, home goods? Do you have home goods? We do. Yes. I haven't been there um, for a while, but yeah, home goods. I just, I just love, like, I wish I could turn my computer on. I have this, this queen size outdoor swing that is just laying ready for me to go out there, but it is 114 degrees. So I can't go outside right now, but, um, but, but I get dry, to spend, but it's dry. Hey, two months <laughs> out of the year is hell here. I'll take that. And you're moving to Florida. If you want to like, talk to me about hell weather, good luck because six months out of the year, it's be hotter than hell there, but you probably won't be there the full time. Uh, right. Correct. And, but yeah. when I land in Phoenix, I'd say to my friends, I'm in Hades. <laughs> it's, you know what? I love the fact that people think that because it keeps it from being overpopulated. I'm not kidding. Here's the thing. July, June is beautiful. It's still hot, but it's the first, yeah. it's the first no, month I love of summer. Arizona. July, no, I love Arizona. July, the monsoons come in August and September. Like, here's the thing. I hate September. It's like, you're ready for a different wardrobe and it's still mm -hmm. 115. The kids are in school. It's like, I'm free. You're at a football game and you're like, oh my God, I'm sweating. Like September does suck, but you know what? Way better. Yes, I'll take two. Spoken like a true convert. Um, what is the one thing you've learned about life that you want the listeners to know? Just one, the one incredibly valuable, important thing you've learned about life. And we've already talked about it. It's feeling good in your own skin. It's okay. knowing that you are worthy and that you have skills and strengths and you have an opportunity just like every single person has. Great. Great. Last question. Let me finish it. What's the last book you reread and why? <laughs> I love, okay, first of all, I'm a numbers person. I'm not the best reader because you have to sit down and be patient. But there's one book that I've read multiple times and it's called The One Thing by Gary Keller. The One Thing, yeah. Let the one love. thing be the one thing. Let the one thing be the one thing. Fantastic book. And you loved it because? Because it says we all have the one thing. And if we focus on that one thing, everything else in life will become like a domino effect. And it's about living your passion. In fact, the one thing is the reason why I built this platform. Because I knew I was a financial advisor sitting down one-on-one -on -one with clients because I was insecure to go talk to other people and talk on stages and be one on many. And I realized my real gift is inspiring people. And so I need to get over my fear. And my one thing is to do more public speaking and be on the stages and connect with other people. And that one thing is why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Well, that is certainly your gift because the one thing you do is inspire people. And I know everybody today, I know I was inspired by this interview. And that concludes today's podcast episode of The Trust Doctor Dawn. Thank you so much. It was such, such an, I know we'll be in touch. So I'm not saying goodbye. I will say, I will see you later. And for all our listeners out there, was I not right? Did Dawn not take us for a hell of a ride? So make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to The Trust Doctor. Until next time, be well. Once again, we've concluded another great episode of The Trust Doctor with Dr. Patty Ann. Tune in next week for more insights and advice on how you can create, nurture, and sustain healthy relationships. To find out more about the podcast, visit drpattyann.com forward slash podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share. Until next time.